so along with that note, we'll turn to our last case study, which is BV loss. Because anytime we talk about mapping a large area, it always comes down to, yes, the drone can fly that, that large an area, but with uh, the current Canadian regulation, um, how much, how, how far can you still maintain visual line of sight? <laughs> on that flight. So do you trace the drone? Do you have someone on the ATV and, and trace the drone as it's going through those areas? Or is you know are those areas even even reachable? So I remember quoting for a project for um uh, uh, an area that had the contamination issues. And it was over 3,000 acres of uh, a previous weapon test site uh, that they wanted to map and, uh, and gather the information. And the challenge is obviously you can't, you can't walk. You can't have um, people accessing those without you know, biohazard, sh uh, biohazard suits. So that's why they're looking at the only way to do it is, is basically the BV loss solution. Uh, you know, is to have a drone survey the area to collect the data. And uh, for BV loss, we're really, we're really getting closer to um, Transport Canada releasing the limited uh, BV loss licensing next fall. And that's what we're all really looking forward to because when it comes to the industrial solutions is um, it's, it's really when you are looking at, you know, yes, there is the result part, but then there's also uh, the legality compliance especially dealing with larger industrial sectors, the companies carry larger liability, right? So they do have bigger responsibilities on government compliance. Um, and that really turns our attention to delivering efficiency is not just the equipment capability. It's, it's also the overall workflow. It's the government compliance and it's how much does it cost and take to go down the BB loss route. So currently, you know, on the one project we did in, in the city of Toronto, we were able to achieve a BB loss uh, special flight operation certificate from from uh, Transport Canada, and we've been carrying out those flights since uh, the end of last year. So when we came back and did uh, almost the, the business feasibility study, you know, I have to say that right now BB loss um, is is really more on pushing the the boundaries of what you can do, and it's very exploratory at this point. It's it's fairly costly to get an SFOC for BB loss operation. Um, and the, the large improvement we're all expecting is basically next fall. And what that means is BB loss at that point is gonna become a license. So as a pilot, you have your basic rating, then you have your advanced rating, and then you take an additional training and pass the exam. That's when you get your BB loss rating as a pilot. And as an organization at that point, you also need to have an organizational rating, like an organizational license. Almost like if you look at, you know, from commercial vehicles, companies need to have CBOR, right? At least in, in Ontario, the commercial vehicle operating uh, registration. So same thing like that, uh, a commercial organization, or it can be a single person, can be a private entity who just says, I want to fly BB loss, but they have to go through compliance to get their, almost their commercial recognition on their workflow and safety. And then in addition to that, as the equipment manufacturer, um, you also need to go for the manufacturer rating, right? So it's the three pieces coming together. And unlike the current uh, regulation for advanced where manufacturers just do self-declaration, the moment you step into BB loss, um, the requirements are higher. You can't do self-declaration. You actually need to have some kind of third party and related party recognition or approval for your equipment specs before um, it can be considered accepted for BB loss operations. So ultimately you're looking at three pieces, but once you acquire the three pieces, then you can fly beyond visual line of sight operations. You know, again, we're not talking about urban center, we're saying limited operations, but a lot of the industrial solutions we're talking about on private construction sites, um, you know, on large development areas, you already have the safety procedures and site security in place to manage construction. So definitely those areas you can meet, you can easily meet uh, the limited BB loss operations. And that's when you can see, you know, the efficiency um, alongside with uh, the equipment and the sensor and the workflow development, it's all those pieces really slowly coming together. And personally, I really believe next year, once the, the limited BB loss become um, an official licensing, uh, um, and we're still waiting for definitely next year, there's going to be more equipment and sensor updates. So I think there's going to be a lot better integration overall. 
Uh, again, what are what, uh, we'll turn around the table. We're getting close to the end of our session time, uh, and uh, I feel like there's definitely a lot to discuss. This is just our first expert series, so look forward to explore and uh, and dive deeper into some of the topics we touched on today. <laughs> but I guess as the closing note, I just want to circle around the table to get um, everyone's you know thoughts on what to look forward to for next year. <laughs> we'll just turn around the table here. We'll start with Res. In many, 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 many cases, for me, it's very important because even flying in a small area, so it's not even about those large areas that you can't see the drone. It's about taking off in a neighborhood where the only accessible place is behind some sort of a structure. So that literally puts you in BV loss within the first 45 meters of flight, right? So that, that's what I have to say. I think it's super, super important. And I think a lot of people are prop. I'm going to say most probably they're doing BV loss at some point or other in their missions without, of course, all the necessary requirements, which I think are it's super important that uh, Transport Canada and, you know, as an industry, move, we move to towards the BV loss option for pilots. I know from industrial perspective, a lot of the pilots are really looking forward to operating in the winter from their truck or from their office trailer, right? Versus standing out there with their bare hands on the on the joystick yeah, get, or on the touch get, screen. Getting frostbite while uh, <laughs> while the mission finishes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's. I mean, I, I always like to say, if you look at equipment rating, um, majority of the enterprise drones are are water resistant or waterproof, um, and then they're rated for you know either minus twenty or you know, can even be set, uh, minus 40, depending on the equipment. So the equipment can take it. Uh, operator, on the other hand, it's going to be challenging with the Canadian winter. Um, over to you, James. I guess from winter, um, are you guys are you guys preparing to meet, uh, you know, obviously the BV loss requirement from, uh, from regulation? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, definitely, we've got corridor mapping features with our, our data collection methods and you know, pushing the technology further. Um, you know, there's a lot of great industry leaders out there that are really pushing it. And uh, the technology is getting so sound. Um, Transport Canada has done a great job of kind of vetting out those people that were, you know, just toss a drone up there. And it's kind of like the wild, wild west. We don't really see that so much anymore. People are understanding that they need to go through uh, the training with Altex and their team and, uh, and getting properly certified. So we're excited for BV loss. And like Raz mentioned, you know, having a vertical takeoff and landing solution, you can, you can, you, you can launch it from an urban setting. You know, once it gets up over top of that building and transitions, it's gone. You won't be able to see it. So we're excited for the future of BV loss. And, uh, and also with our, our new Gen 2, we've got remote ID that's going to be broadcasting like a license plate of where the drone is, um, you know, the, the different uh, sensors that might be on board to air traffic control so that, you know, you can actually see where it is in the air. Um, so safety is going to be a big one and we're definitely on board and, and definitely looking at that. It's definitely the future of, of, um, of aerial mapping for our, for our industry. Um, Kevin, I mean, before we even get into just BV loss, I, I think we, we talked about uh, solutions for uh, even in-air detect and avoidance specifically for BV loss flights, right? Because that's a big piece is how to identify uh, different objects in the air. And for example, you know, when we talk about remote ID, it's, it's a great safety improvement, but that doesn't 100% prevent a drone from, say, colliding into a bird or, you know, a small uh, Cessna that doesn't have transport founder on the smaller non-compliant airplanes, it still doesn't stop, you know, those type of mid-air collision. Um, so Kevin, I guess along the overall solution, what are you looking forward to, you know, with uh, the integration of equipment sensors and uh, and all technologies working together? Well, I, I think you summarized it nicely. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the integration, right? I mean, we're at a big inflection point. Um, and I see it in the new products that we get, you know, where we have these control systems, which have a hand controller as well as a remote controller that will control multiple aircraft. We're seeing Parrot launch the Anafi AI, which is uh, controllable over 4G networks. So obviously that'll work with 5G. So there's a lot of that, that integration. Um, and then the sensors as well. We talked about SLAM and some of these things, but there's a lot of much lower cost technologies that are going to enable this sense and avoid. And then the cool thing about being in Canada, I saw I saw Kate let us know something earlier in the in the chat 
But what uh, her new employer, Andro Robotics, is doing in this kind of a space, really pushing the envelope. There's some big, huge companies in the power and energy and in the um, in the transportation space that are doing it. Drone Delivery Canada. There's lots of people that are really, really pushing it. So I think that that's really exciting. And of course, what you're doing at Altex Yifei with the with the training part of it, that's that's a huge piece to ensure because all these big organizations that are going to do it, they need to be compliant, right? And so all of that stuff is 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 what I'm looking for. And then we're going to see guys like like Raz and gals like other in the same space that are going to be pushing it from a service provider side to say, okay, well now, now can I get these things? And ultimately it's going to take those big companies a long time to deploy these things at scale. And it'll be the smaller service providers that are going to say, Hey, I can, I can get my gen two wing tra. I can do a couple of things. There's going to be some new sensors and away we go. So that's right. I mean, it's awesome to be Canada in this space. And Alan, I saw something in the chat. If you're going to be a chef, you want to get into drones food food delivery get a ghost kitchen deliver by drones there you go there's your business idea uh thank you <laughs> later and remember me when you're on your yacht in 10 years <laughs> great thanks everyone i think today's a, a great kickoff of our expert series and just as a, a quick preview on what's to come um we definitely have a next topic focused on more of uh, a water solutions. So drone inspecting water, um, you know, like Raz mentioned, there's also some pond storm water management. So we're definitely going to be talking more uh, in the next episode It's going to be more focused on the water type of solutions with drones. Uh, along that note, there is uh, a question on the Q&A asking about, uh, you know, if someone doesn't have the uh, photogrammetry or industrial or mapping drone experience, where should they start? Um, my recommendation is obviously, you know, training is always good. Look for specific training, right? Not just drone training, but more, you know, there's tons of uh, um, continued education courses from uh, even locally, for example, from Seneca College, from civil engineering. They have uh, GIS, which is a graphical, uh, geographical information system courses. So those will definitely help you understand how to service the construction or industrial sector. Um, I know we talked about lots of drone pilots who thought they can just buy a drone and call themselves surveyors. You know, a lot of those business models didn't work. But there are also tons of people who are just really good with technologies. They, you don't necessarily need to have industrial background, right, to run a really good, you know, successful service-based company. As long as you do your homework, understand what your clients are actually looking for. As long as you can show that you're delivering results for your clients, you know, at the right cost, um, people are, 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 generally speaking, people are interested in technologies. And what I love about the drone industry is uh, from a sales perspective, this is, the, this is the easiest industry to start a conversation with any of your potential clients, right? Any other industry to pick up a call to get a client interested is always difficult. But this is actually a great industry because people are generally interested in the technology. Um, so along that note, I believe we covered all the questions along with Kevin's, you know, um, great uh, recommendation on food delivering. <laughs> so I look forward to having the experts with me uh, for our uh, series of sessions coming up. Thanks, everyone.